Well, hello, my friends. Welcome to the Artist Next Level podcast. We are super excited to be here with you, Drew Harris and myself. We welcome you today. We're going to talk about the anatomy of a series. What makes a body of work successful or unsuccessful? We're going to share our stories or struggles or joys or happiness and everything in between of building bodies of work. So don't go anywhere. It's going to be a great chat. Resources, inspiring interviews, business practices, and practical advice to take your art career to the next level. Join Sergio Gomez in today's Artist Next Level and get ready to take control of your career. Well, Drew, good to see you again. Welcome back. Good to see you, my friend. Yes. Welcome, welcome back. Super excited to chat with you today about a topic that actually we have been talking about quite a bit, and not only you and I, but also inside our next global program, as we have a challenge that we already have kicked in on building a body of work. And uh, you and I, we have some good stories to share. Of, Absolutely. Uh, bodies of works, collections, Uh, series, whatever you, however you want to call it, you know, on uh, building those things, right? And the value. All the things that can go wrong. <laughs> exactly. So uh, let's uh, let's dive right mm -hmm. in, you know, this conversation yeah. about its own work. And, and maybe before we actually talk about the stories and things like that, um, let's talk about a little bit of the value of building a body of work for an artist. I think it is uh, something that many artists Um, know well, but others who maybe are starting their career or emerging, you know, they're, they're still trying to figure out, is that something I should do? So maybe let's start there. Yeah, great discussion point there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what do you think, Drew? Um, okay. Why are you building a body of work? I'm on the hot seat, am I? Okay, well, you know, uh, thank you. And uh, thanks again for letting me uh, sit in, the, in this seat. Um, yeah, you know, it's, a, it's a, one of these uh, things that we're told throughout our career, you know, we've, we've, we've come into the creative field for a reason. We want to express ourselves, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean we have to stick with, you know, creating widgets, you know, that every piece has to be identified as a Sergio Gomez or a Drew Harris. I think over a career's time, you can, you can start new things, new developments, new materials. It's a growing process, right? Mm -hmm. But having said that, Uh, you can, I think it's essential that we, if we start a series of work, that we are consistent in that body of work, because mm -hmm. I think there's nothing probably more uh, disturbing for a viewer or a gallery even than mm -hmm. to, to see, you know, you got halfway through your show and then you decided, you know, you were working in acrylic and now you're going to work in oils, which are completely different medium. Mm -hmm. And you know, different effect. So I think the consistency of the theme, you know, we got to do this. We have to, mm -hmm. you have to be conscious of this. And, and those, that in itself poses a problem uh, or can pose problems. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, sometimes we can get bored halfway through a series of work, but we're committed to creating it. So you have to keep pushing those boundaries mm -hmm. without flipping into appearing like another artist completely right yeah yeah And yeah no. yeah so i would say you know i love what you said about uh, the value of uh, building a value of work as, as an artist and i'm gonna also switch it on the value of the marketing part of it you know i love to talk about mm. things marketing so i think also yes adding to what you said you know after the series is done uh Having a body of work allows you also to be more creative in your marketing for that particular series because you can really be playful with your with your title, with your vision, yes, absolutely, your branding, how you talk about it, what you say about it, and mm. so I I always see a, a body of work like as a complete package, you know, that we get to yeah. think through as an artist from beginning to end. And then beyond how it lives in the world, you know, through. Yeah, very important. Or the very, body. very important. Yeah. And, I, you know, a lot of us don't ever think that through right. to the end of the product that you right. help us uh, create mm -hmm. through the through your expertise. You yeah. know, how, how do you market something? If it's not consistent, 
then you know you are going to look uh, kind of kind of crazy you know in the end when you have a thematic that that suggests otherwise what you've created mm -hmm. so yeah absolutely consistency is your best uh, method exactly so i think we have established now in the first few minutes the value of building a value of work as something that as artists we should invest time we should invest effort we should mm -hmm. uh invest of our thinking into putting those together so now let's go into maybe some of our stories and through the stories we can you know pick things that we can share you know or value to our friends who are listening can learn from our mistakes and also can learn yes. from our successes <laughs> yeah. i think that i'm gonna, that is the I'm gonna hand it off to you this time all right you always ahead. hand it off to me <laughs> <clears throat> perfect so I'll tell you okay. my my story of my very first body of work that uh, I documented and the lessons I learned from that. One. So, mm. and I Excellent. shared this a little bit on a webinar that I did recently talking about the, the challenge building a body of work. But uh, when I first graduated from school, I finished my MFA. I was so excited. First time an artist in the world not in school anymore so my friends and i we rented a studio space and we were like the you know we felt like the luckiest kids ever right uh we had not many commitments it was just the fun freedom. time yes exactly yeah. let's let's <clears throat> make 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 so <clears throat> uh, when i encountered myself in that situation you know the question is okay what do you do when you don't have any longer assignments for school when you don't have deadlines when you don't have you know, uh, critiques, you know, what is it that you want to make? So mm. that was the first mm. time that I'm like, okay, I want to build a small collection of pieces that, um, that embody some of my current concerns, which back then I was starting to think a lot about the figure mm -hmm. and kind of like making that a central part of my work. So to me, like this first series was like, I had to create a statement of of this new artist Sergio Gomez right when and what it was about true yeah so very important yeah I went back to drawing I started working with paper and then the that's the first series where the idea came about to glue the paper to a canvas and start creating the vertical pieces that to today you know how people know me for um the size typically size of a door one figure in the center so that was like the mm -hmm. very first series with I would say started everything and something that uh, I think it's a, uh, I'm so grateful I did. And maybe it's something for our friends to, to think about too, when you guys build your body of work is I documented that series. I took photographs of all the steps throughout that series. Yeah. It was 25 years ago or so. And to this day, I can go back and look at the series. I can talk about the series. I can do a lecture based on the series. And I, you know, in retrospect, I'm like, if I had not done so, it would have just been lost in my memory, right? This is true. Very, you know, see, you're always forward thinking. You're always thinking about the marketing. I think even when you, yeah, you know, started your career, started, mm -hmm. you knew that this was going to be an important element years on so that right. you could refer to it. Mm -hmm. And you know? uh, so I, I built this series. And for the first time, you know, I was able to create something that was outside of an assignment from school and that I felt that all my emotion, all my energy, everything that I wanted to say in that particular moment was made visible. And mm. I even to this day, I think it was one of my strongest um, bodies of work that mm. I've ever made. And it was only six pieces it's not like 20 six pieces but these were large pieces too and, yes, exactly. and, and that, that also is an interesting point uh that is is good for listeners and that is you know you determine your your capability i think right by the size of work that you do so mm -hmm. you know a lot of people start small because they think well i'm just a new artist and uh just you know, I, and i can i have the confidence to handle a, a one foot by one foot painting yeah and then there's some of us that just say that throw all caution to the wind mm -hmm. and we say well i think my first body of work is going to be eight feet by eight feet or in your case the size of a do an actual door. door right so that's big work and that right. shows confidence and that's mm -hmm. a part of that 
that uh, development as an artist, once you do that, you know, start with that monster piece, mm -hmm. you'll always be known for these monster pieces. Right. And, and you know, as a new artist, that just gives you that much more confidence. Yeah. So look I, where you're doing today. You're, you're still totally creating right. large work. You're and totally right. Back large, right? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and I remember, you know, looking looking back, you know exactly what you just said. Um, when I was a younger artist and right off fresh out of school, you know, being able to participate in a show and bring in large pieces was something that people remember me for, you know? Yeah. Because the and, scale and, they, pulls attention. and look what you've done. Well, that, that element of confidence. Mm -hmm. uh, knowing that people know that you work yeah. large, <clears throat> excuse me. And you know, th this is the kind of thing that I think, you know, this is a fundamental starting point of your entire career, your entire life. Mm. You'll never go back, you know, to being, to doing this very, very small works. Although you have, Although I have, yes, exactly. Uh, yeah. But, but your natural ability is in large work. Uh, right. And people expect that. Exactly. Exactly. And, and there's, and there's the, uh, uh, not only what they expect, but also like what you expect of yourself, because you know, you can pull it off, right? You know, you can. Well, there's a comfort was, level, isn't there? Yes, exactly. Really. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. oftentimes when we're building an exhibition or building a, a body of work, you know, you've got commitments at the end, you've got your marketing, you've got your gallery that expects you mm -hmm. to show up with your work. Mm -hmm. And if you start to do work in sizes that, are not comfortable that you're not comfortable with at the beginning of building that right. body of work. Mm -hmm. There's a greater percentage of chance that you might not make those deadlines because, right. you know, changing the scale of your work is going to have a huge impact on the work itself and right. how you present it. So you always start in my opinion, and I think mm -hmm. you know, this as, as well, clearly you start with your comfort level. So, yes. If you're a five by five or six by six or door size artist, then promote your work as a door size artist, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and build that next body of work at that size, you know. So that's one thing you've already accomplished. You know, yeah. you can work it. Yeah. Now is the idea that you can expand that creative within that size. Right. And something else that was, I think, very key and important on that first series is that you know, and this was like the practical thinking of uh, remembering <laughs> that all my friends who painted large and then the moment that they got accepted into a show, they had to rent a pickup or find another friend mm. who had another pickup or get a, a U-Haul or, you know, it was really difficult and expensive. So I remember, you know, sitting down thinking, I want to large paint large, but I don't want to. <laughs> I cannot afford it. Yes, exactly. I've been renting truck every time I have a show. How can I make this large, but at the same time movable? Yes. And uh, that's when, you know, experimenting in that series, you know, I started with a small sheets of paper, then I gluing them to canvas, doing testing, and I figured out, well, actually, once they are hanging, they're nice and flat, and I can roll them as long as it's a loose roll, you know, and I can actually, you know, uh, make it work so i yeah i started really thinking about <clears throat> the practicality of it you know for me to make the choice of painting large storage um mobility especially for you know a, a young artist who yeah. was just getting out of school and trying to to figure out how to pay for things <laughs> well you know see there this is why you know you are who you are today because you're always you know you're always thinking ahead and the most practical approaches to your work, you know, you have mm -hmm. to, you have to be able to market something. You have to get it there. You have to roll it. So you learned all the applications of, you know, techniques and, uh, mm -hmm. in order to sort of, you know, balance everything out. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I started out doing large canvases mm -hmm. on restrainers. Uh, and then I had to say, well, now I have to ship them. <laughs> How do I make you know, and I remember we're doing one of my major shows in your city, in Chicago. In Chicago, yeah. And showing up, you know, at the Canadian border, uh, I think in Detroit, with a truckload of paintings. And not you, knowing, you know, and I drove them down there. Oh, you drove them me. to Chicago? Yeah, I yeah. drove them to Chicago. I remember that wow. so well. I, <laughs> I drove all my works to every show. If it was in New York or Chicago, 
Toronto. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't drive it to Vancouver, but uh, <clears throat> but it's, that was an added expense. And so yeah. there was a risk there. You know, I was investing so much money mm -hmm. and it had to work. Mm -hmm. So the stress of that is also, uh, you know, important. You have to know that you have to work to your stress level. You know? right. right. And all those additional costs. So you were already as a young artist, you were already preparing that. It's mm -hmm. fantastic. But, but here is a, and with this one, I finished on this particular series, what I wanted to kind of share with our friends is that as I was thinking about this idea, okay, I want to make the work flexible and movable. At the same time, how am I going to pull it off so that galleries will accept it? Because it's loose, you know, right. it's not. So I had to like purposely think about conceptually how would this presentation have to do with the topic, the themes and the ideas that I was working with? Otherwise, mm -hmm. it would just look like a lazy artist who just don't want to stretch it or just want to save a few <laughs> bucks, right? Because it's the yeah. truth. A lot of galleries yeah. and museums will not accept it. And that is one of the questions that a lot of artists ask me. So how do you get, you know, galleries and museums not to have a problem with you not stretching your artwork and lose, and lose uh, showing it? you know, in that manner. And the answer is I had to come up with a compelling reason why what I did was important for the conceptual uh, ideas that I and was... And what was that? With. What was that? In so the way, I, pu the way I pulled it off is this. So because I'm dealing with, in my work, uh, uh, with the uh, play of humanity, right? Or fears mm -hmm. or struggles mm -hmm. or, or joys and... Um, all, it, when you look at my figures, they're all either melting or floating or, you know, sort of spiritual. So they are fragile. And at right. paper, yeah. my surface is paper. Paper mm -hmm. is, cannot be any more fragile than paper. It's attached to the canvas for, you, know, you have it more, ri more rigid, but without being like, a, you know, like when you stretch them on canvas, they become flat, like, like you know, like a drum. Yes. I, yeah. I want yeah. them to, as they are on the wall, be straight, but at the same time have this idea that they they could the float. Move the wind. Exactly. That's interesting. I like that. See, now that's that's good thinking. I think. Uh, you know, when it worked. When, <laughs> it worked. Yeah. Well, you're convincing someone that otherwise would say, "Well, it's not in the frame. It's it's too right. It's too. Uh, you know, we're gonna have challenges and it's, on, it on it's unfinished. Canvas, stretcher, or something. Yeah. Well, it's unfinished, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> But actually, it's finished. And now when you say you want that free flow mm -hmm. of air, of movement to create, there, there's also there's a connection to the thematic in your work. Exactly. And, and it's important. If, the, if those things aren't floating, even slightly, mm -hmm. there's no connection. Exactly. And then for the, to make them visually also look finished, because the there's something about a word that has to look finished, right? Of course, um, yeah. you know, either as we talked about before, either painting the edges or or putting a frame or something. So in my case, to make it look finished, what I came up with is in all the pieces to this day, uh, and I started on that series, I left a white two-inch border all around, just mm. like any door has a two-inch two-inch border all around. So that became also part of the uh, conversation, and it was quite interesting to see how. You know, some critics that wrote about my art talk about, you know, that frame as a visual separation between the figure and the other side and us, right? So, yeah, and I think that the human, <laughs> the human psyche is always, <clears throat> excuse me, we want to put everything within a frame, you know? Yeah. And exactly. if you create the frame, you know, and I did the, we did similar things, you know, yeah. uh, the, the, when we work with paper, I don't work to the very edge. I, I use a tape to tape off mm -hmm. at least that. about a two inch area. So I leave the deckled edge of the paper, but I'm, yes. but I'm very sort of graphic. It almost it feels like it's been printed rather yes. than painted. Uh, but I keep that two inch border and I'm very particular about it. Yeah. But I, I don't ever go right to the edge of the paper because then it, it doesn't solve that problem of uh, cleanliness and framing and the psychological effect of having this sort of white border frame. Exactly. We always want to be, 
we want to see our images kind of enclosed in that. Yeah. In that Somehow area. separate them from the world in some sense. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I think that's, you know, again, forward thinking. Mm -hmm. Most artists would say, well, I'll worry about it later. And then, then the other thing, too, is that you've done something that can be framed. Exactly. It can be float mounted into under glass right. or yeah. air spec or plexiglass uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, um, or mounted on a yeah. solid form. Exactly. You know? Yeah. And so then, you were offering every uh, aspect in there, I think. Yeah. And in a practical way, when one of those pieces sells, I give the buyer or to the gallery a little PDF that show mm. that kind of from the artist recommendations on how to preserve the piece were three options. One, they can keep it as is and some collectors like it. They send me pictures of how it's just, they have it hanging the way I put them just with grommets on the corners and just free hanging. Right. Uh, there's also the option of mounting it. Yeah. And, or creating uh, a wood box frame. Yeah. And yeah. And then protecting it with glass or plexi. And those are the three options that I usually recommend and they get to choose. But a lot of people yeah. like the, the free hanging Unless I said, I always say, unless you have kids, if you have kids, maybe I don't recommend that ocean because <laughs> they might be. Yeah, that's true. yeah. Or dog. Puppies, yeah. puppies, puppies exactly. don't like uh, things that float on walls. That's so funny. that's my story. <laughs> uh, so let's, let's go with you, Drew. Uh, tell me one of your kind of series where uh, we can learn some, some good lessons from. Uh, well, there's, you know, I, I don't have a lot of the, you know, when I first started out, I also worked on paper because I was a drawer. I lo loved mm -hmm. drawing. And I actually hadn't studied paintings. So what I did was uh, I created little paintings on the drawings. Oh, okay. And then so I was fascinated by patina and, and, you know, this sort of old walls and cracked, cracked walls and brick and, you know. So I did those in drawings in large format and four by eight feet you know, the big, big drawings, mm -hmm. all done with a, you know, a 2B pencil, 4B pencil. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in order to get color into the paintings or into the drawings, I ended up taping off sections of the painting, of the drawing mm -hmm. with, with tape. And then I would go in and paint a little tiny abstract painting. Inside. Inside the drawing. So that <laughs> they, and they were called the... Uh, I can't recall now what they were, what they were called. It was a great series, and it was my first show mm -hmm. in um, in Canada. And I was only uh, in my late teens when I did the show, and I did it with a colleague of mine, a printmaker. So he was oh, also wow. working on paper. So it was a you know, paper uh, show. It was basically a paper show, and we were kind of local artists. Uh, uh, and and but I, the funny part of that story is, mm -hmm. there's always a learning experience with mm -hmm. one of your first initial shows, you know, or, or the yeah. first body work that you produce did this great show. I was very excited. We were given a great opportunity to show in a museum. Mm -hmm. uh, so he and I, his name was Jim Sebesta. Uh, he and I put the show on and we had the opening Okay. and uh, we had a whole crowd of people. I mean, and generally they were more, more older, more sophisticated. We were kind of, we were really young. Yeah, the I mean, young crowd. <laughs> yeah. And however, remember, we take away something from every show we do. We yeah. learn something that's whether it's related to the art or not. Mm -hmm. I remember doing this sort of stand up kind of comedy routine with the crowd, right? Yeah. Talking about my work. Uh, and, you know, I've been relatively comfortable with people standing in front of people. I can, I can generally keep a conversation going, as you know. Yeah. But I I came away from that and, you know, we went out for dinner afterwards and, you know, the congratulations and everything else. And then when I got home, I asked my girlfriend at the time, I said, so was there anything that I missed in that? You know, because we're not, we're not conscious when we're talking so much. She goes, well, you could have thanked the gallery. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? That was the best. The best <laughs> lesson I learned yes. right at the beginning, uh, the, my first show, uh -huh. and I had done everything, you know, I had thanked the other artist, I had talked about <laughs> me, 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 and I forgot to thank <laughs> the, the gallery. The gallery going by the uh, you know, and that was one of those learning experiences that came with that body of work. Yeah. Right. I it, never, 
I learned so, so, something so valuable that, and mm -hmm. that was simply, you know, you can create the work and you can be, yeah. you know, fabulous as a teenager, mm -hmm. but there are people that put you in those spots yeah. and they have to be acknowledged. It's right? like getting the Oscar and forget to thank the Academy. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I, 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 and it was a moment where I, for years, I cringed. Every time I thought about that, I thought, <laughs> you can't go back and do it. You know, you can't go back and say, oh, by the way, I thank the gallery. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, each, each, se each, uh, each session or each uh, series of work has that kind of little bit of a lesson. The yeah. other more important one, which I think is, is common amongst most artists. Mm -hmm. uh, we started talking this morning about, you know, when you build a series, you have to be consistent. You have to be mm -hmm. also very, uh, yeah, you have to be cognizant of the public that you're going to be showing to the gallery's expectations. Right. Yeah. And one of the, <laughs> I mean, I, and again, you learn something from each show <laughs> and it's not really based on the work itself or the, the reaction it's about how you run your business mm -hmm. so i've been i'd been fostering this relationship with the gallery in toronto uh they kept ignoring me uh and finally they said okay we'll we'll do a show for you mm -hmm. and, and they were really not a painting gallery they were more photography but they decided to take a chance okay <laughs> so i said great you know we committed to it sort of a contract signed everything They liked my work that I was currently doing mm -hmm. and they expected me to sort of present a show based on that. <laughs> and a year later, you know, when they came to the gallery or to, to my studio to see the work that was going into their gallery, I had completely changed my technique, oh, completely my changed. And I felt justified in doing that. And yeah. yet they were like, oh my God, you know, This is what not we what we saw. signed up for, right? <laughs> yeah, this is not what we signed up for. Wow. And that that in a way hurt my relationship with the gallery. Yeah. yeah. Uh and because it tainted it right at the beginning. And mm -hmm. and although the work was very good, it wasn't to their what they were hoping for. And right. so they had already done all the pre prep, you know, of finding <laughs> the clients to they had sent out examples of my work. Yeah. And yeah, I'd gone on this total tangent somewhere else with different colors, different sizes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I learned something again from that show. That's a very good lesson, you know, because very. Uh, like working with your first relationships with galleries, you know, back in, back in our days when we started working in shows and things, there was no internet or YouTube yeah, right. videos that you could watch. You, you kind of learn as you went. And uh, yeah. Mistakes. And also the fact that we, You know, the, it was a pain in the butt, you know, to, to photograph your work and then yeah. send over a, a slide. You know, <laughs> exactly. this is this is what I'm doing, mm -hmm. right? Or photocopies. They could not see you on social copies. media. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. There's no social media, and they could you couldn't just take a shot with your phone and send it over and say, "Hey, this is kind of the direction I'm moving in." Right. You know, they they would they would come in and it would be a, a entirely new experience for them, and it was like, "Whoa, <laughs> we didn't sign up for this." And you'd, and then it was like a lot of backtracking and then a lot of repainting. Negotiating, yeah. Yeah, and so you have to be, you have to put all of that in into that body of work. You have to mm -hmm. understand that there are expectations. Mm -hmm. And if you don't live up to it, it's your responsibility to live up to those yeah. gallery expectations. And exactly. if you don't, that only hurts you. It hurts you and the, the relationship you have with galleries mm -hmm. going forward. Because that and, information gets out. Yeah, and there have been cases in which a gallery last minute decides to drop the show, you know, because they just... just yeah, uh, they didn't what? get what they expected. Exactly. You know, if you're going to do glass poodles and you show up with, uh, <laughs> you know, wooden houses, you're going to... It's going to be like, wait a minute, we wait, were it's... expecting glass poodles, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, the consistency is the best uh, best advice I can give and you know these shows don't just come out of the sky right right there has to be planning so a gallery wants to know that you are committed to producing that work that they like mm -hmm. and their public will like yeah and if you just go off in this tangent because oh you know i'm an artist <laughs> then <laughs> you know it's just gonna wreck your relationship it can backfire yeah especially in the oh, world of totally. today like you say where 
everything is connected. Everything is You're connected. Right. And everyone is connected, yeah. And, and one yeah. other point of that is like the galleries can do the same too. They oh, can absolutely. keep pushing an artist to create the same thing over and mm -hmm. over and over to the mm -hmm. point where you have no energy left for that particular style of work. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a gallery, I won't mention names, but they, you know, the last sort of year or so that I was with them, they would say, you know, hey, we need more red paintings. <laughs> I go, well, I don't want to do red paintings. <laughs> sorry. Red painting. And it became like, okay, you know, I might as well have been staring out the window while I was painting mm -hmm. the paintings. Because it was just, that's all they wanted were red paintings. Yeah. And I didn't want to produce red. The, the energy wasn't there. So you can... So it can work both ways mm -hmm. and you yeah, sever and that relationship after that because you, you can't give them what they want and you don't want to. Exactly. Exactly. And, yeah. and yeah, there, when there comes a point where there starts to become like this factory of you're satisfying the client or the gallery, then you, you know, you kind of start losing the enthusiasm for the work at that point. Entirely. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so that's a, so that how, that's how it works on both sides. I think yeah. we're, we're all responsible. Exactly. You as a gallery owner, Sergio, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, you and I have done a show together. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I brought my work from here to there yeah. and yeah, you know, in even that I can give you good examples mm -hmm. on where perhaps I began to change my direction in my work halfway through that exhibition preparation. Mm -hmm. And you were expecting something with more red. <laughs> As I recall, we right? all love your red <laughs> yeah, you know. and i yeah. and i kind of eliminated the red for some odd reason I but, was you just, but you brought me one painting that has beautiful beautiful red remember and i got a good response and that was amazing so yeah so <laughs> so but i did you know and i did that consciously because i knew that you 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 wanted that yeah you liked that and so i had yeah. to work with the gallery too and say okay i'll create a piece Without you, feeling obliged to do it, yes, I did exactly. it in the as part of the series, and it worked beautifully. Yeah, yeah, no, th totally, totally. Uh, you know, yeah, uh, we made it. We made it work. And uh, so let's talk about that. Also, the idea of uh, maybe some of our stories of shipping or traveling with our art. You know, uh, you talk about coming to Chicago with your show, but you have traveled many places with your art. I have too, and uh, maybe some yeah. of those stories might be might be fun to share. Some of the some of the uh, hardships. I didn't know that you actually drove your artwork to Chicago, which is <laughs> kind yeah, of two times. <laughs> <laughs> so I, but those I, were the days and you, you know, you could show up at the border and say, you know, you were, this is what you I'm were going. a young artist and you know, yeah. and they'd go, what do you got in the truck? And you'd say, I don't know, 12 paintings. <laughs> and they'd, and they would go, where's it going? Uh, well, to a gallery. And then they'd say, right. Do you have documentation? No. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, go. <laughs> okay, go. <laughs> Not you today, look like though. An artist. Yeah, you look like a, that doesn't work anymore. It doesn't post work, man. When you're in 11 world change, yeah. No, nah, the world changed, and boy, oh boy, that's another, that's a whole other topic. We yeah. can talk so, about customs and right. clearance. I had a, and, yeah. I had a, a, like a choice to make when I was invited to have a solo show in Romania. So the curator uh, who, who invited me, um, you know, we went, we were working for about a year, you know, preparing for the selection of the pieces. I made some new mm. works, some were quite large. And, um, so it, it was a big space. So, you know, there were probably about 25, 30 pieces. Um, most of them, the my scale, you know, the, the door size and a cup, and there mm. were three that were like double door size paintings. So we were thinking, okay, how do we ship them there? Should we ship them? Should I bring them with me in the airplane rolled up? So uh, because I wanted to be part of the installation and the whole process, so we decided, okay, I'm just going to uh, travel with them myself. Oh, no, I can see. I can hear something coming and, here. I and, don't know. And see what happens. So, you know, we flip the coin and let's do it. So you have to say, okay, I'm, let's do it. So I went to the hardware store. I get those big tubes. Um the sauna tubes, yeah. Yeah, so I, I got two of them. I taped them together, so it became like one, look like a one giant binoculars, you know, <laughs> two giant tubes taped together with tape. And I put uh, paintings half in one, half in the other, sealed both sides. Looked really good, created a handle for them. And um, so, you know, 
you go to the airport here first in Chicago. So what is it? So, well, it's, you know, it's hard. I have a show. You know, I had an, a letter of invitation. I had all the programs to show. And I um, said, okay, no problem. So they put in the airplane. Um, first stop, I think, where did it stop? I think it stopped in Germany. Now, uh, again, it was in the belly of the airplane, so I didn't see the pieces until I get to Romania. So I get to Romania. And uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I didn't know if they were going to bring him, like, because it's not the typical luggage shape. It was mm-hmm. bigger and rounded. So it's not coming through the belt. They're like, what's the to, what elevator? To, yeah, what happened to my baby? belt? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, they're, they're too big for that. So um, I'm just kind of waiting and looking around. And then I see a guy on the other side of the, you know, or the luggage area that's coming out with these huge tubes. And like, oh, geez, you know, that's, that's my guy. So I went, he didn't ask me anything. He said, is yours? I said, yes. Yeah. So I just grabbed him. So then said, okay, first, first uh, worry is done. I got my tubes. Now I need to go through customs. What am I going to tell yes. what, what this is? You know, because this is, these are big, big things. So I'm like, I'm going to go uh, with like all the, um, my, um, like, like the best face I can put. Uh, uh, um, what would you say this? Confidence. As, look as with my, innocent. Yeah, no, I want to say possible and I want to say yeah, innocent possible and with as much confidence mm. as I can. I'm gonna walk with <laughs> confidence through those doors that what I got in my hands, there's nothing wrong with it. You know, I'm yeah. not gonna be acting like you know, sure. like I don't know my way around. So I, I stood I stood for a little bit from a distance, kind of see how it all worked, what what the door people went through, who were the guys, you know, who were checking and um who they were stopping. And that's what I did. I grabbed the two. I walked looking like if I had gone through that door like 20 times and walked the door, nobody said a thing. And I passed through customs <laughs> like nothing. <laughs> and you're like outside sweating. Oh, my. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, the heart racing is uh, that. It, I think that that in itself is just the because that can make or break what you do uh, yeah, totally. as an artist. You know, mm-hmm. they have the decision. They have the right to decide whether those paintings go through, right, without documentation, or right. we even with documentation. Yeah, yeah, no, I have they can stop you. It just <laughs> depends on who it is, you know. Yeah, I my, used to my, store my underwear and my socks and stuff in the tube, in the so painting. I'd have more room in my luggage <laughs> when I went to take gifts and that kind of thing, right? So I'd stuff all my clothes in there, and then they'd X-ray it, <laughs> and then I'd say. They'd say, well, I'd say it's paintings. And then they'd say, well, what else is in there? I'd say, mm, underwear. <laughs> and, they, and they would go, okay, well, we don't want to open that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's a, that's a good, that's the best piece of advice of the whole podcast. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah, put your a, underwear in the artwork. <laughs> it was Logan. a common way of doing it because like you, you know, I had to roll these paintings mm-hmm. relatively uh, loosely. So I was going through customs like yourself with these mm-hmm. tubes that are probably a foot and a half in in diameter mm-hmm. and then eight feet long, right? They're, they're big. They look like missile launchers, you know? <laughs> yes, exactly. And, and when they're strapped, two of them together, that's even more ominous. Right. But because I didn't want the paintings to crush, yeah. and you don't want the weight of putting another tube inside it, mm-hmm. that tube, I just stuff it with clothing that's or good. blankets. And uh, or in some cases, bubble wrap and that kind of thing. But uh, yeah, and it was a great way of transporting two things Mm -hmm. uh, and then having my clothes on the other end. You know, it's like a piece of luggage and it worked Mm -hmm. two things. Yeah. So my experience was arriving here in in Kuala Lumpur, mm -hmm. my first ever exhibition. And the dealer forgot to pick me up because we'd hit, hit the time difference issue oh, you know goodness. so i'd said i was coming in on a certain time and he thought i was t- referring to canadian time and it was a crazy mix-up and i arrived here at midnight with two tubes like yourself strapped in together mm-hmm. yeah uh, not knowing the language nothing i oh, got into the waiting area and he didn't show and i phoned uh, a friend that had uh, his friend mm-hmm. and uh, she said well i can't pick you up tonight but Tomorrow I can. And uh, <laughs> so you showed up in a, yeah, these are eight foot tubes, like two of them together. Uh-huh. They were a foot and a half 
wide. So this is a big package, big, big yeah. heavy package. She goes, just find a hotel and I'll oh my pick you up in the morning. And she picked me up in the morning in a, in a Mazda Miata. And uh, <laughs> so we drove down through into Kuala Lumpur with uh -huh. these eight foot tubes sticking out of the back of a Mazda Miata, <laughs> like so rag top, right? Yeah. So that was my first experience of coming overseas with big paintings. <laughs> wow, that is crazy. Yeah, yeah. I know that those are the stories of travel with our art, right? And I'm sure our friends probably have their own stories too. Please do share yep. it with us. You know, we'd love to hear your story. Yes. Send us a message uh, and tell us your story. Every, of your every experience is, is a new experience for someone. You know, it, and and a good learning thing. It's, you know, I I made assumptions about uh, sending my work to Chicago in '99. Mm -hmm. I made assumptions that it would be the same in 2022, mm -hmm. and it wasn't. Mm -hmm. And I I learned my lesson. I I missed something very important, and it cost me money. It cost me time. It cost a client money. You know, and so wow. it's a big, you have to be buttoned down this and you have to know what the current regulations are Yeah, because it, what we were doing pre nine 11. Yeah. You could basically take your paintings anywhere because you were an artist and they didn't know how to right. deal with you. All of a sudden now it's like, okay, you have to have this manifest. You have to have this, you have to have approvals. You have to have this code. You have to have this. It's a nutty experience, but it's well worth it because you yeah. learn each process. Mm -hmm. and your work gets to its destination. Yeah, no, totally. Well, the first uh, curatorial project that I got to do in Europe, it was in uh, in Italy, in the city of Turin. A museum invited mm. me to curate a show wow. of a Chicago artist, and it was a big show. So we had a lot of art, so I had to figure out like how to ship the artwork the best <laughs> way possible. So fortunately, we had a lot of time so you know, to ship the artwork. So I, I sent it through Ocean, we rented a half container, filled it up with art. And uh, what I did is I like, because of all the paperwork, as you mentioned, it was like, I, like if I try to do it myself, I know I'm going to screw it up. So we hired yeah. an the broker. Agent, yeah. Who yeah. did everything for us. We just give him the list. This is what it is. You know, charges, what, whatever it's going to be. But I know that all the paperwork will be filled in. Oh, it's so important. I can't, I can't tell you that is probably the most important information you're going to get today yeah. from this uh, is that it's the crossing the T's and dotting the I's. Oh yeah. my God. And it, you can have one word wrong. Right. And they can decline you. Mm -hmm. You can have, you know, Oh, it's just, it, you have to know what to say so that there, there's no suspicions and you know we're not doing things illegally it's just that mm -hmm. we don't aren't doing things rather efficiently either right you know and normal mm -hmm. you know so and, and there are so many yeah, codes important. that sometimes you pick the yeah. wrong code for what you're bringing that screws the whole thing up yeah mm -hmm. and I, again you know back to the tubes you know don't ever assume that your tubes in cardboard are going to make it because they, they won't because <laughs> yeah you know, airport staff don't care about whether the, you know, the tubes. I remember sitting on plane, mm -hmm. watching my tubes roll up, watching them load my tubes of paintings, and they're so big, they right? So you know what they, they're they're <laughs> yours, yeah. and I'm sitting on the plane watching them load these extra size things, and is going up the ele uh, up the belt, and it rolls off and tosses onto the ground. <laughs> oh my! And God. these guys just kind of pick it up from either end and slam it back down on this elevator and yeah. i was like wait a minute that's my hey buddy knocking on the window <laughs> yeah yeah hey, Stop that's it. my Stop heart <laughs> and they don't care right so again that's another that's another podcast we can yeah you know talk about how Shipping. to pack exactly yeah. well but, let's uh, yeah let's move now the conversation into kind of uh, what the topic is of the the anatomy of a yes. successful series right if we were to dissect a uh, successful series from Drew Harris or from Sergio Gomez, you know, what m would make it successful behind, you know, once we open up? <laughs> okay, once you're you're going to be on the hot seat there. <laughs> I think, in my opinion, I think a successful series is one 
where it goes beyond the the characteristics of the artwork itself, but also shows the temperament of the artist and the depth yes. of understanding for that particular idea. Even in the most abstract of works, you know, I, I think a strong series shows a commitment from that artist to go deep. Yes. Yes. And deep and deep and deep, like digging. It's like digging, digging, digging in order to find the gold. And I think a series is the process of digging further in into the earth. Yes, indeed. Absolutely. And that to me is a successful series. Yeah. And do you have examples of that recent or? Of mine? Of a series yeah. of mine? Uh, well, yeah, I think, um, you know, because I've always worked with series. And I'm going to just now, I'm going to go opposite. I'm going to go with a small series, like small size. Uh, mm -hmm. Because as you say, you know, people know me for the large work and I love making the large work. If I were to choose every day, I would just make a large work. But mm -hmm. um, um, small series, I think, and I think this could be refreshing for friends. Sometimes, you know, you are in a season where you don't have a big space or you don't know, you know, uh, where to work. I had a season where um, I couldn't go to my studio uh, because of health reasons, is the, my bigger space in the city. So that's when I started painting in the basement of my house here. Uh, you've seen it. So, yes. you know, there's no natural light. It's all tube lights. Not the, the ideal. It's really cold sometimes in the winter, even mm. though it's, there's a heater, but it gets still cold. Uh, so it's not the ideal of situations to make, you know, a larger body of work. But I really had an idea, and I really wanted to work on this body of work based on immigration because it was also a time uh, here in the United States where the immigration uh, conversation was uh, was getting a lot of heat. Um, mm. And and because, you know, I, I came from Mexico, so I knew a lot of uh, also other people who came from Mexico and who were still coming or going. And mm. this particular, you know, story that I read was about uh, children who die at the at the border. Right. Right. And, in this border. So yeah. I'm like, well, I cannot go to my big studio, but I want to make a a, a a series of pieces and one bigger anchor piece that you know will kind of bring all these pieces together about that topic. So I spent a lot of time first researching, learning, reading, imagining myself, you know, in the shoes of, of those kids, of, of mm -hmm. the police officers, of everyone who's involved you know, in what's happening at the border. And uh, back then my kids were, were younger. So I really put a lot of effort on go deep, right? Not just, yes. okay, I have this idea. Let me start painting something. But I really yeah. feel the emotional baggage of, of this. And which for me, again, I'm not even at the border. I'm all the way in Chicago, right? But just mm. remembering the stories of people that I knew, uh, you know, the who struggle, yeah, the emotions and, and yeah. things of that nature. Were so I did this series in my basement, and um, because they were there were larger pieces, I had to do two or three at a time and put some down, put some up, put some down. I mean, it was it was uh, much. That's how much, you have to work. Yeah, it, 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 yeah. it was a much tedious process, boring a lot of times, you know, because I had to put the the artwork on the floor and I, there was nowhere to walk until it dry. So for a day, I couldn't do anything, you know? So, but uh, I think that was one of my most successful pieces in terms of going like deep into a specific feeling idea yes. emotion that I had in mind. And I find it that, um, um, you know, the, the message was so strong that I had to say that the, even making them in my basement didn't matter. You know, it was yeah, just of course. a little obstacle to overcome, but I had to say what what I needed to say through the work. Yeah. And one yeah. of the, yeah, and then looking back, you know, I think also it became got recognition that Barrio World traveled in Mexico to two museums in Mexico. And then what the main piece of that show, or that body of work, I should say, uh, it went through a national tour uh, here in the United States uh, through a traveling exhibition uh, for a whole year. It was on loan for a whole year visiting different cities. And but that's you know, a I, that's a great story. That's the intensity of yeah of building concept. And and uh, I think thematic. Yeah. 
Yes, and, and I think, you know, for me, the lesson is like, sometimes we can look at the inconveniences or like, I'm going to wait mm -hmm. for I get the better studio or the yeah. bigger space or the yeah. nicer light. And, and I'm saying this because I think there might be somebody here listening who is in that moment where you have something you want to say, but your circumstances are not the ideal. Mm -hmm. And my kind of my challenge for you is how can you make it work given what you have? Yeah. You know? Yeah, and work to the to to the space that you have. I mean, we are okay. we don't all start out with big studios, and, and no. in fact, we don't all finish with big studios either. Right. It's not a it's not a given that you have all the perfect environment. Some of the best artists that I know mm -hmm. are still working from you know a back bedroom. Yeah. And like in your case, you were highly successful, and you and you have done a percentage of your work in a relatively small studio. Mm -hmm in your home, but you've dedicated yeah. that space to there. So you create a whole sort of energy within that space. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to have North light and, you know, mm -hmm. the songs of birds and outside, right. and all of that kind of stuff that we put, we think we need. Mm -hmm. We don't, we, right. we need, what we need is the inspiration. Right. And what that inspiration doesn't come from, you know, how beautiful your studios. Right. And that probably, you know, I, I assume like with the pandemic, a lot of artists had to readapt themselves, of course. you know, to where yeah. we work. Like even for me, that's when I realized, wait a minute, why I'm not spending more time at home making, I have to travel to the bigger studio yeah. when yeah. I can do more work here. I learned that from the pandemic. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, and I, again, you know, it's just what we're given at the time. Uh, yeah. A lot of artists had to give up their big studios during the pandemic because they couldn't afford them. Mm -hmm. So it, what they do, they still needed to create. So they did it, you know, on their, on their uh, kitchen table or in a yeah. back bedroom or in a <clears throat> corner of the living room. It's still your art. It's, it doesn't matter right. where it's created. Right. You know, I remember doing a series um, <clears throat> called the fragile earth series. Mm -hmm. And Beautiful I was, uh, yeah, that was a really great series. And that was one of those series that, that fell together like or came together so rapidly uh mm -hmm. but speaking of what you just mentioned studio space i was working in why well, had a little gallery in penang uh mm -hmm. malaysia and you know it, it had limited working space because you know you were operating sort of a public gallery so you didn't mm -hmm. i didn't even want to be working you know in the middle of the floor and then people come to look at the yeah. other art And I was showing other artists and national names. Anyway, uh, so a friend said, I have this old building and it's got no windows. It's got a roof. It's got electricity. You know, it's got lighting and, uh, you know, a lock on the door. That's it. <laughs> Use it. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I jumped at it and I said, sure. And I'll tell you, that was the best thing ever. He, wow. he offered this for free. Mm. I gave him wow. a painting in the end for, yeah. I think I was there for about seven months working oh wow yeah and he just gave me total freedom he just said don't worry i'm never even going to show up at the building just use whatever you make a mess it's going to be renovated anyway so yeah and i went into the studio of course we don't need air con and, or we don't need heat and because in the tropics so i made a huge mess in his studio <laughs> <Huge> but, <mess. laughs> to which he he his contractors i think kind of you know were a little angry later when they did have to <laughs> renovate it but uh the series came together because it was an impassioned series yeah you know we were seeing so many different weather patterns happening and the series was based on not only uh weather but it was like looking down on a on an earth and the dividing lines that we put in there and we don't mm. physically go and mark a you know mm -hmm. down there is uh you know we do sadly we, we on you know We put borders. Territorials, between yeah. Yeah, but we don't, you know, when we put religion and mm -hmm. we put environment, we put mm -hmm. resources higher than people's lives. Yeah. You know, we we value these things better or more so than the, the values of people's lives. Right. So this became a sort of even deeper series, mm -hmm. even though they were abstract works. Mm -hmm. I was trying to identify the fact that We, you know, one country that's sitting right next to another country, 
doesn't have a physical line through it. Mm -hmm. You know, like Canada, U.S., I've mentioned this before. We don't have a physical line. No one's chalked the line out. You know, they, you don't step over that. Well, we do, though. We determine our, our countries. But the resources that we have are completely different. So now mm -hmm. Canada has all the water and trees, and the U.S. has all the power and money. You know, mm -hmm. and kind of we have something that you need, and you have something that we need. And yeah. now our country base or our land mass uh, is shared or mm -hmm. not shared in some cases. Yeah. You know, and that goes in religion and economics, and resources. Mm -hmm. So that that series was so impassioned. Mm -hmm. uh, and I did it, I think, in eight months. And I, I presented it here in, in uh, Kuala Lumpur. Mm -hmm. And it was a great. But the amount of work I produced, it was why? Because I had, first of all, I didn't care about space. Mm -hmm. I had an idea. Yeah. And that idea was just... Every day I got up so excited about what would come to next. pursue that idea. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do, do uh, you write as yeah. you as you develop those ideas? Do you write or uh, do, no. do you make notes or? You know, yeah, I made notes in sort of visual form. Okay. Techniques and you know, and, and next week when we when we have because we're currently in this uh, you mm -hmm. at the art next level, uh, artist next level you've been doing this uh, challenge for how to build a body of work. Mm -hmm. And next week uh, will be my opportunity to show what I've been doing. And, mm -hmm. and that, uh, uh, so I'll be using that series as an example yeah. about something that just go uh, one spark of an idea, a news story or something that affects you mm -hmm. can build an entire, you know, career. Mm -hmm. and, and that, that could be the strength. And that could be the thing that puts you sometimes in the map, you know, because there's absolutely there's, there's a relevancy to the world, the world today, you know. Yeah. And I think we have to be conscious of that, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but it's it's not a given, you know, if right. you want to paint, you know, portraits or, or flowers, you know, you mm -hmm. want to paint a vase of flowers and make that your career. That's OK. There's nothing yeah. to say it's, it's different than you and I working. Right. Uh, but you have to be impassioned about it, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and you have to know how to be consistent with that, whether your body of, you know, building a body of paintings of flowers, mm -hmm. but make them the best paintings of flowers. Right. And that make them your paintings of flowers. Yeah. Not yeah. somebody else's. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, uh, and I think that defines your anatomy of a successful body of work in, in a sense. Absolutely. Right. It's identified. This is you on canvas or this is mm -hmm. you on in picture form. Right. You know, it could be photography, photography for all that yeah, matter. Absolutely. Yeah. Or drawing uh, and, or working on paper. And I think I think photographers understand even more the idea of series collections because they, of you know, photo shoots or, uh, you know, editions and that. And they have, a, I think, a better grasp of working you know yeah and we all know our influences in that regard you know you follow certain photographers or painters or whatever and they are very they're very systematic they have they have a very common theme you can recognize their work everywhere mm -hmm. but it's intense every piece they do is intense mm -hmm. so it's not just sense simply widgets anymore it's now exactly. it's their life purpose you know i mean yeah. i think that that is uh, environment has become my issue mm -hmm. loosely I'm not an activist, mm -hmm. but I want people to think about our environment. So yeah. I put them in paintings. Right, right. Yeah. Love it. And like yours and yourself, and I mean, I have to tell you, mm -hmm. I mean, what is inspiring about your work is that you have allowed us to think about spiritual, about mm -hmm. people, about life, about afterlife, about, you know, the, the process of growth. Right. Uh, it's, I think that th that's your message, and it has been – well, your whole career, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, so, absolutely. Yeah, I think that I think that's that is quite true, my friend. And believe it or not, we've go. been we've been at it for an hour, so I think uh, uh, we're gonna have to start <laughs> wrapping it up. And uh, you uh, said, we done. 
I know. You mentioned also that next week uh, we're going to be talking about that topic of what happens in the studio, about building a value mm -hmm. work. So it's a great opportunity to invite our friends. If you want to join the challenge, you can still do it. Yes. So sign up for the Building a Value Work Challenge from the Artist Next Level uh, website. Just go to theartistnextlevel.com. You'll find a link uh, under the description of the video. Check it out. It's a four-week challenge. Week number one, Dr. Ana Gomez talks about mindset, wellness, you know, kind of working at the, at the body of work with uh, confidence. Uh, mm -hmm. Then week number two, Drew talks about studio practice, you know, building uh, your body work, how to start, inspiration, preparing the studio, you know, as yeah. well for that. Yeah. So it's going to be great. Uh, week number three, I will be talking about uh, the marketing pieces, you know, writing about your work, uh, titles, etc., things of that nature. Uh, and then in the last week, I'll be addressing, um, and all of us kind of will be, you know, also participating on that on uh, getting it out into the world, you know, getting yeah. it into shows and how do you uh, send it, how you approach curators, etc. A, a lot of a lot of question and answers yep. in that last week as well. But mm -hmm. question and answers can happen all week, you know, or exactly. all, each week for the whole month. And I think that that's what we're trying to encourage is people to get engaged and, and, yep. you know, no question is silly. It's a, exactly. you know, everything's about our career. So as simple as you think it might be, it's probably very important for so many other people. So right. ask the questions, you know? Yeah. And uh, no matter yeah. where you're, when you're listening to this podcast, you know, even if it's a uh, two or three weeks after we actually publish this episode, you know, check it out still because, the way it's designed is so that mm. anyone can take the challenge, even if you feel like you may be a little late. No worries, because it's only four weeks. So what yep. you got to do is yeah. just watch it in order. <laughs> That's about it. You got so. it. <laughs> well, my friend, uh, thank you so much for joining me again. It's been such a great chat. Um, we, Always uh, inspiring. We will be doing more episodes where we will have also other guests to join us and mm -hmm. chatting with them. So I expect more of that as well here at the podcast. And if you want to uh, meet with Drew, he also offers one-on-one -on -one sessions. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, we call them one-to-one, one-to-one <laughs> -one sessions. And all you got to do is go to thatisnextlevel.com or then uh, also contact Drew directly. And Drew, if you can say where our friends can find you on social media and your website. Yeah, it's, uh, well, both are the same uh, on IG or Instagram is Drew Harris Art. And on uh, my website is drewharrisart.com. Perfect. And for me, yeah. you can find me at Sergio Gomez Art on Insta and all social medias and on the web at Sergio Gomez Online. And of course, you can find us both uh, along with Dr. Ana Gomez at theartistnextlevel.com. So thank you, my friends, for listening. Do us a big thank favor. You, Tell your friends about this podcast. If you've been enjoying this uh, kind of a longer chats that we've been doing lately, uh, you will enjoy what's coming up so you gotta tell all your friends you gotta tell all the yes. artists you gotta listen to the podcast and send them the link super easy whatever you listen to whatever app you use or the web you know you send them the link and um, just subscribe just subscribe so that you automatically get them every week so yeah and you, if you have a comment or and you want us yep. uh, to answer a question or even have a topic to discuss let's uh let's open it up uh no topic is is uh, untouchable right. we are we'll talk about anything Absolutely. Thank you, my friend. Thank you, Mike. Thank Have a good you, one. Sir. Check out our website at www.theartistnextlevel.com, where you will find our podcast library, learn about our upcoming webinars, find resources relevant to your career, and much more. Thanks for listening to today's podcast, and we'll see you at the next level. Mm -hmm.